heart. There is a myth that the Great Wall of China is the only man-made structure you can see from the world, from the moon, sorry. So as you're looking down from the moon to planet Earth, the myth says you can actually see the Great Wall of China. But it is a myth. You can't actually see it. It is great, but it's not that great. It is an impressive structure. I don't know if anyone's actually been to China. Yeah, David's been. Uh, I don't know if you ran along the 2,149 miles of its length. It was built over a period of 2,000 years. It was built so that no one could actually climb over it and invade. And it was built so wide that no one could actually break through. It was a solid wall, an effective wall. And yet during the first 100 years of that wall's existence, China was invaded three times. Three times. Not once did the enemy break through the wall. Not once did the enemy climb over the wall or even dig under the wall. Nope. They simply bribed the gatekeepers who opened the gates and let the enemies in. That's how simple it was to conquer what was beyond. Now, walls are meant to protect us. In ancient times, if an invader wanted to conquer a town, the inhabitants all retreated within the safety of a wall. One of my favourite places in the Midlands where I grew up was Warwick Castle. And if you want to spend a good day out, go to Warwick Castle. You'll need the whole day. But the whole community would leave the village on the outside and run within the walls. The drawbridge would be lifted. The port, cur what's it? The port callus would drop down and people would be safe therein. A city whose walls are broken down has no defence. But you are safe within the walls. Now the key verse in this chapter, as I mentioned earlier, is verse 23. It is the centrepiece of this session, of this section. And around it, the rest of the chapter revolves. Above all, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. The word that's translated into English as guard means keep, protect maintain so straight away there's an assumption there that you will be attacked it's not saying maybe or if it's say it's literally saying when it, when it happens you must guard you must protect you must maintain this is not a maybe this is a warning a will be and as the one guarding the heart the owner you should be aware attacks are coming and therefore adapt the right attitude, the right tactics to defend, to protect, or to maintain your heart. The streets of London are paved with gold. I don't know if you saw anything yesterday. Whenever I go, there's not much gold. There's plenty of litter, but there's not much gold there. But did you know that is literally true? That under the streets of London uh, are housed 6,500 tons of gold stored in seven volt systems under the city. The problem we've all got is we can't know exactly where and find it. The largest by far lies in the Bank of England. It holds three quarters of the gold in London, or 5134 tons. Now, finding it is probably harder than stealing it, um, but it's buried. And the reason you can't steal it, it is guarded. It is protected, it is secured, it is defended, it is shielded, it is caged, it is kept safe. And that's the idea in verse 23. The heart is the gold. Maintain it, defend it, keep it, guard it, cage it, protect it. Above all else, that's your number one priority. Because if you don't, then you're going to fail in every other area. Now, every day as believers, we fight a, we, a spiritual battle for the heart. God wants the heart, but so does the enemy. And so does self want to rule in our own hearts, our own lives. But when we fall, so often like the Great Wall of China, we fall because it's an inside job. We have that sinful nature that so often gives way and lets the enemy in. We can keep the door. We can keep him out. James, in his letter, 
in chapter 4 and verse 7 reminds us, resist the devil and he will flee. But we're so weak. But I misquoted James because he gives you the key to resisting the devil. He says this, submit yourselves to God and then resist the devil. We have to resist the devil in God's power. We cannot resist him in our own power. So if we are right with God, we will be defending the heart. We will be protecting the heart. We will be resisting the enemy. And if we try to do it in our own strength, then we will fail. So I, I, I divided this little chapter into three key headings. Here's the first one. A choice. A choice to guard the heart. Look at verse 10 and 11. Listen, my son, accept what I say. And the years of your life will be many. I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. Now verse 10 contains the fifth instruction so far from a father to his son. And it might sound familiar words. Oh, we're back on this choice again. We're back on this two ways. Why the repetition? Well, all us dad know, knows exactly why. No one ever listens to us. So we've got to keep saying it again and again and again. But actually, the more serious answer, or the better answer is, repetition is a good teacher. Repetition is a good teacher. In the world of advertising, modern research believes that the average consumer needs to view at least seven or eight times an advert before they take it in. And that's why they keep pumping out the same old adverts. And even the BBC, in between their programmes, are telling you what's coming up because seven or eight times it eventually registers. Repetition is one of the cornerstones of any advertising campaign. And especially in our world of pop-ups on Facebook and social media, where we've got short-term memories, repetition is there to remind us and the book of Proverbs works on a similar basis. It takes a theme and then it kind of weaves it throughout the book. It keeps coming back again and again and again until we get it. It changes it slightly, but the same principle is always there. It's a case of choices. And in verses, especially chapters 1 to 9, there's a lot of repetition. The same theme presented in different ways in the hope that you will eventually get it. Now, in this section, we've got that familiar way of choosing two ways. First, the way of wisdom and righteousness. That's God's way. Secondly, the way of folly and sin. That's the wrong way. And every day when we get out of bed, every day when we leave the house, every day if we're even in the house, we've got a choice. Wisdom and righteousness, folly and sin. And over and over again in these chapters, the father reminds his son, be wise, be good and moral. Don't be foolish, impure and sinful. A friend of mine was in a secondary school and he was telling them about Jesus and uh, he said this to them. He said, uh, look, he said, I've explained the person of Jesus, why he's important. I've explained about Christianity, but I guess some of you are, are going to say not for me. Why won't you follow Jesus? And one girl put her hand up and he said, yeah. And she said these words to him. She said, I'm not going to follow Jesus because I want to live a little first. I want to live a little first. I want the good life. And then, you know, at the end of my time, I might think about God, religion and Jesus. My friend said, uh, well, unless you follow Jesus, that's all you'll ever do. Live a little and that's what the psalmist or the proverb says here, Solomon in his wisdom. If you want long life, physical and an enriched life, according to the writer of this book, the more you commit to God, the more you experience it. And the less you commit to God, the less of life you enjoy in all its fullness. So it's ironic, although everyone wants to get the most out of life, we ignore the prescription and the one who prescribed it, his advice on how to get it. Look at verse 13. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. 
last week at our house party, Penny was um, interviewing some of the leaders. Every, uh, every morning we have a session in the busyness of the weekend, and we always have kind of a testimony spot. And Penny interviewed a number of leaders, and she asked them one simple question in the build-up to how they became followers of Jesus and what that means to them. And uh, the question was something like this. Um, what did you want to be when you were a child? What did you want to be when you were a child? And there were a number of answers. Astronaut, footballer, nurse. You know, no one ever gave the philosophical answer. I want to be happy when I grow up. I want to be happy. And that's the key, isn't it? We want to be happy when we grow up. We want to enjoy life. Life is for living, not for enduring. And this father says to his son, make sure you hold on to wisdom. Make sure you guard the heart so that when you live, you live and you don't just exist. So he shows his son two pathways. One leads to life and light. One leads to darkness and death. And it's all to do with your attitude to the heart. Notice the contrast. The guarded heart, when you choose wisely, verse 10. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not be stumbled. The unguarded heart, again, verse 14. Setting foot on the path of the wicked and walking in the way of evildoers. We might paraphrase verse 14 as if you choose bad company, you'll allow that bad company to lead you into bad ways. So you can walk in good ways and be unhampered and run straight without stumbling, or you can choose bad ways and bad people will lead you into bad ways. Again, verse 16 and 19, he explains at length the reason why we must guard the heart and avoid sin at all costs. And uh, in great poetic language, he says, for they cannot rest until they do evil. They are robbed of sleep till they make some trouble. They eat of the bread of wickedness and drink of the wine of violence. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked, it's like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. So if you want to summarize these verses, the father cautions the son, prize wisdom for his own good and avoid sin at all costs. So the first heading really is the choice. The choice. Which path do you want to walk on? Righteousness or sinfulness? Secondly, there's a command to guard the heart. Verse 23. Now I've mentioned several times, this is the key verse for this chapter. The centerpiece of the section. Around this verse, the rest of the chapter revolves. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. You might remember the old joke that went something like this. Man with farm seeks woman with tractor. Please send picture of tractor. <laughs> Man with farm seeks woman with tractor. Please send picture of tractor and we kind of smile and we find that funny because we know he doesn't really want the wife he wants the tractor that the wife owns his motives are wrong now the phrase here guard your heart is usually used in a relationship situation parents see their daughter or their son find miss or mr wonderful but they don't think they're quite that wonderful and they say be careful be careful, don't give all your heart, don't give out all your emotions to that person because I don't think they're trustworthy. I think they might use you or abuse you, so be careful. Guard your heart. And the parent, the grandparent, the friend, they think there's something unclear or suspicious about that new love, might say, it's going to end in tears, it's going to end in heartbreak. Be careful who you give your heart to. And the point of using those words is to say that if you form too many personal attachments too quickly or too carelessly, or to put it another way, you don't let your emotions override your intellect. You need both. And when it comes to love, it's very hard to do. We let the heart rule the mind. 
And verse 3 is actually saying, and you can translate it this way, guard your heart with all guardedness. Guard your heart with all guardedness. Now, what do we mean when we talk about the heart? It's obviously the Bible doesn't mean the pump that sends blood all around the body. The term heart is there in over 1,000 times in the Bible. It never refers to the pump that sends blood around the body. It has a deeper meaning. It is the most common, and here's a long word that I might struggle to pronounce, anthropological term in Scripture. The most common anthropological term in Scripture. In our modern usage, we talk about the heart, you know, in terms of... Uh, of emotions, don't we? Valentine's Day, what do you see on cards, on presents, on everything, on wrapping paper? Heart, 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 heart. It's a sign of love and affection. But in the Bible, the heart has a much broader term. It includes thinking, emotions, decision-making, and more. Thinking, emotions, decision-making, and more. So that's a kind of a, a threefold dimension. Thinking, feeling, and choosing. That's the heart, the real us, the inner core. And this instruction from the Father to the Son is simple. When it comes to the heart, guard, defend, protect, look out, shield, maintain, and watch over it above all else. You might know the story of Little Red Riding Hood. A Little Red Riding Hood goes to visit her grandmother. And, of course, the big bad wolf has got there ahead. And the big bad says, why do we tell these stories to our kids? I don't know. It's no wonder they're traumatised, isn't it? The big bad wolf locks Granny in the cupboard and he puts on her clothes and he sits in the bed. A little red riding hood comes in and she sits down and she says, uh, my, what great big eyes you've got, Grandma. And she, Grandma replies, all the better to see you with. And then she says, uh, and, and I, uh, uh, what great big ears you've got, Grandma. And Grandma, or the big bad wolf, replies, well, all the better to hear you with. And then little ride riding her says, my, what great big teeth you've got, Grandma. And the wolf replies, all the better to eat you with, and runs out and gobbles her up, or tries to. But little red riding hood runs away. Sorry, I woke Dave up then at the back. <laughs> Now, the moral of the story is this. Without discernment, you put yourself in serious jeopardy. You can't just keep getting closer and closer, and, 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 and if there's danger there, get out. Don't just toy with the situation. Eyes and nose and ears and playing. When you spot the danger, get out. That's the moral of the little red riding it. Or I think it is anyway. Discernment, good judgment will keep you from flirting dangerously with the enemy who's there to destroy us. And that's why the Father, in verse 23, gives the same exact advice. Guard your heart with all guardedness. Without discernment, without good judgment, the enemy will destroy us. And then the third and the final heading I've got here is the cause and effect of a guarded heart. The cause and effect of a guarded heart, verses 23 to 27. I asked you during the kids' talk how many body parts were mentioned in verses 23 to 27. There are five verses, and I made it four body parts. The heart, the mouth, the eyes, and the feet. The heart, verse 23. The mouth, verse 24. The eyes, verse 25. The feet, verse 26 and 27 and actually if you go back a verse to verse 22 the ear also gets a mention turn your ear to my words so you got the ear what we hear you got the mouth what we say you got the eyes what we look at you got the feet where we go and you got the heart who makes the choices and the father is stressing to his son that the wisdom of God is designed for every area of our life. It shapes who we are, what we say, what we look at, and where we go. And then that little chorus, but it's so well, didn't it? Be careful, little eyes, what you see. And I love that little chorus because normally when we... I, I, I nearly chose the word, the consequences of a guarded heart, but consequences always seems to be negative. 
You do this and that will happen. And I didn't want something negative because it's not. And in that kids' chorus, it's not negative. Be careful of the lies, what you see. It says, the Father up above is looking down in love. It's positive. It's positive. He wants to keep us from evil. So the song is not a condemning song, but a warning song. And so these verses are as well. The ear, what we hear. The mouth, what we say. The eyes, what we look at. The feet, where we go. And the heart, the choices we make. So in summary, guard the heart. For the third time in my sermon, and they say repetition is good, I want to emphasize this point again. The ESV translates it this way. Keep your heart with all diligence. The King James Bible uses the word diligence. And the Living Translation says, guard your affections. Melvin Mormer, you won't know him, but he was a US soldier. And he writes these words. When I was in the US Army, I remember we had to pull guard duty many times. The purpose of guard duty was to ensure that other soldiers and equipment or areas were guarded from the enemy. I rec can recall in basic training or boot camp, we had to memorise three general orders. The first one was this. I will guard everything within the limits of my post and quit my post only when properly relieved. I will guard everything within the limits of my post and quit my post only when properly relieved. When we were properly, properly relieved, there was a password that was spoken between the person and the guard duty, and the one that was relieving them. If the improper password was given, you were not properly relieved. The safety of all that was being guarded depended upon you, the person on guard duty. If something went wrong, or the enemy was able to access into that which you were responsible for guarding, then you were held accountable. The punishment was inevitable. Solomon says, if you guard the heart, it will protect everything else. The mouth, what we say. The heart, the choices we make. The eyes, what we see. The ears, what we hear. The feet, where we go. There's a great uh, proverb that we'll look at in chapter 27 that says this, as water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. As water reflects the face. We'd say if you look in the mirror, it gives you a true representation of yourself. We used to use the term photographs never lie, but with Photoshop they do. But when you see your own reflection, you see what you look like as others see you. There's an old saying that says, you are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. Got that? You're not what you think you are, but what you think you are. The heart is the real you. What we see, what we hear, where we go, the choices we make, all come from the heart. So if you make good choices, you'll be a good person. And if you make bad choices, you'll be a foolish person. So guard it, guard it. Why? Because everything you do flows from it. One translation says, from it flow the springs of life. What we are on the inside, in the heart, come out. And finally, behaviour equals the heart. The principles from Proverbs chapter 4 have a New Testament twin. In Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul talks about Christian behaviour. He instructs about Im uh, immorality, malice, slander, obscene talk. He instructs about relationships in the family, between husband and wife, between children, in the workplace. He instructs about compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, unity. And then there are three keys he draws to our attention to do with the heart. In verse 2 he says, Set your heart on things above Set your heart on things above, not on things below, above. And then in verse 15 he says, 
People in, whose heart are set above know the peace of God down below. And in verse 16, people whose heart allows the word of God to dwell richly will be uh, the one to experience victory in the areas he mentions. Areas of morality, family life, and other things. So if you want to see Proverbs 4, New Testament twin, how we live it out in our daily living, then read Colossians chapter 3, which talks about verse 2. Set your heart on things above. Put God in his right place. The end result, verse 15, you will know his peace in your heart. And verse 16, allow the word of God to dwell richly in your heart and it will affect the decisions you make in life. Let's pray. Lord, you transform us inside out. Religion says conform. Go here, do this, practice that. But Lord, you deal with the heart, the real problem. And you've reminded us again this morning, if nothing else, Lord, that we need to watch the heart. So help us to do that today and this week, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.